Hello again, this is Rich Troxler, aka Rich Trox, and welcome to another edition of my Surf Fishing Tips videos. When it comes to catching fish consistently, being able to read water and beach structure is a valuable asset. I've put out several videos on the subject already, but there seems to be some confusion as to the tides and conditions that best reveal a beach's true nature. Due to the dynamic nature of the ocean and beachfront, this is understandable. So in this video, I'm going to try and sort it all out and hit the high points as quickly and as orderly as I can. For starters, this video assumes you have an understanding of how waves work and to be familiar with the terms I will be using. So if you haven't already done so, it will be to your benefit to watch the first video in my Reading the Beach series on Understanding Wave and Wave Action. Like most things in life, one size does not fit all, and so it is with reading water and identifying beach structure. Some beaches are fortunate to have all kinds of easily identifiable structure, others not so much. Some have almost nothing to offer in the way of obvious structure, but there is always something somewhere as nature never does linear, so it can really pay off if you can sniff them out. Let's start with the beaches that have really obvious structure, what I call superstructure. Some of my previous videos, such as identifying sandbars, cuts, and troughs, have pictures and video footage of these structures at low tide. And when a beach has an abundance of these structures, all you generally need is a nice day, a leisurely drive along the beach, and dead low tide to identify them. They basically stick out like a sore thumb. With obvious structure, you're not really reading water so much as looking directly at the beach formations. You don't fish them at low tide, but you will certainly know what the bottom is doing when you come back to fish the area at high tide, and this is particularly useful at night. So for identifying really obvious structure, a low tidal stage is far more important than reading water in combination with other conditions at high tide, when these structures will only reveal themselves through wave action. So if your local beaches have great structure, you are very fortunate, because there are many more beaches that do not. One of my favorite structures to fish on any open beach is a hole. For the 40 plus years I fished stripers from the beaches up north, I pulled more bass out of holes than any other structure. That's not to say I haven't experienced some wild fishing around T-bars or cuts or other superstructures. It's more a function of availability, as holes are far more common along most beaches than other types of superstructure. I explain them in detail in my video, Holes, Points, Lips, and Rips, but for now I'll just say that holes are frequently located next to points. Typically it is the sand moved from the hole by current that forms the adjacent point. The current is usually a product of a coastal storm or large surf conditions. Holes can also be washed out cuts in a bar, where rip currents from storm surge overpower the smaller cuts and wash the sand edges straight offshore. As I've said before when referring to beach structure, sand doesn't disappear, it always goes somewhere. Holes and points may reveal themselves at low tide, but in most cases, it's wave action that gives them away. But certain conditions make it easier to identify them, and some conditions make it almost impossible to identify them through wave action alone. The best conditions to identify holes and points, and pretty much any less obvious structure, are the top half of the incoming tide, moderate surf, and either no wind or a light onshore breeze. These conditions provide the truest wave formations. Conversely, a strong offshore wind will hold up the waves from above the waterline, causing them to break prematurely. An outgoing tide will push against waves from below the waterline, also causing them to break prematurely, not unlike a standing wave. And big storm surf is just a mess and renders the water unreadable. All of these adverse conditions provide either false positives for bottom contour or unreadable water, and this holds especially true for holes. Points reveal themselves in a wider variety of conditions than holes do. Under most conditions, their hard, shallow bottom causes waves to break and spill further out than their surrounding areas. But if you're still not sure what you're looking for, just go find where the surfers are. Holes, on the other hand, pretty much disappear during the previously mentioned adverse conditions, and here's why. First off, on many basic sand beaches, holes aren't that much deeper than the surrounding bottom. I'd say somewhere around 2 to 4 feet is average. It doesn't sound like much, but it's a large enough difference to affect the way water will flow in the area. And that's what water does. It flows from one place to the other, seeking its own level. And that's why tidal stage is very important when trying to identify holes by wave action alone. Here's a quick primer before we move on. Tides are the alternate rising and falling of the sea, the vertical movement of water. 
Current is the horizontal movement of water. The tidal bulge is caused by the gravitational attraction of the moon and the rotation of the earth. It's what drives the tides. Waves are energy. A wave moves, but the water it travels through does not. Water doesn't start to move until the wave starts to break, either through interaction with the bottom or because of opposing forces. In physics, a standing wave is a wave which oscillates in time, but the amplitude profile does not move in space. The nautical version of a standing wave is a wave which is unable to move forward because of the interaction with opposing current. Again, the point is that it is current that causes the wave to break, not interaction with the bottom. And lastly, waves come in sets. This is usually a period of smaller waves followed by a group of several larger waves. So here's how all of this fits together. When reading water, you want the wave sizes to be optimally matched to the incoming tidal stage. The object is to gauge the bottom contour by where the waves break, how the waves break, and how the water behaves. So the ratio of wave height to water depth is very important. To illustrate this point, let's look at the extremes first. Big waves rolling in at low tide over shallow bottom will tell you nothing of the bottom contour. All of the waves break pretty much equally because of the interaction with the shallow bottom. At the opposite end of the spectrum, very small waves at high tide will also do nothing to indicate bottom contour, simply because the bottom is too far away to interact with the energy in the wave. And wave sets can be confusing at times, as the smaller waves will interact with the bottom to a lesser degree than the larger sets. The optimal incoming tidal stage for identifying holes and dips in a bar is the stage of the tide that most closely matches the amplitude of the waves coming in from the ocean. Easy, right? If the bottom contour comes up and interacts with the wave's energy, the wave breaks. If the bottom contour drops below the wave's energy, the waves roll through and keep rolling until it encounters bottom to interact with. Depending on the relative depth of the bottom, bigger wave sets may give a better idea of bottom contour or make it harder to read. Some of you may be asking, so why doesn't this work on the outgoing tide also? This is where tidal bulge and current come into play. For those of you who have ever ridden a bike, a simple way of thinking about this is to remember what happens when you ride with the wind at your back. If your bike speed matches the wind speed, then you feel nothing, not a hair out of place. But when you turn around and ride at the same speed into the wind, you feel twice the speed of the wind pushing against your body and holding you back. Well, the same thing happens with water. On the incoming tide, the tidal bulge is pulling water in the relative direction of the wave, and more water is being pulled through the hole or dip than over the adjacent shallower bottom. This is because water seeks its own level, and because the wave's energy is not encountering any opposing forces other than the bottom, the wave maintains its purest form and provides the most accurate indication of bottom contour. When the tide is outgoing, the opposite happens. The tidal bulge drags water away from the shore, with more water being pulled through the hole or dip because, again, water seeks its own level. The water moving away from shore through the hole is an oppositional force to the wave's energy. This causes the wave to break, much like a standing wave, and can easily be mistaken for interaction with the bottom. Once you get used to what you're looking at, you will always be able to tell when the tide starts to ebb. It usually causes the surf to kick up some and get more confused looking. Wind direction and speed will also have much the same effect as current on how waves break. The main difference is that wind acts on the wave above the waterline and current acts on the wave below the waterline. So using the bike example again, wind moving in the direction of the wave at or below the speed of the wave will have little effect on the waveform. When moving against the direction of the wave is an opposing force, which slows the wave down, causing it to break prematurely. The point is that optimal conditions are the best starting point for reading bottom contour through wave action. So here's the condensed version. On beaches with highly pronounced structure, dead low tide, particularly a moon tide, will allow you to eyeball the actual structure so you can game plan for high tide. The best conditions for determining bottom contour through wave action are incoming tide and light onshore breeze. The optimal conditions are the incoming tidal stage that best matches the wave heights. With small waves, the lower stages of the incoming are best. With larger waves, the higher stages of the incoming are best. So hopefully this information will help you dial in the best conditions and tidal stage for reading water in your area. If you want detailed information on what you can expect to see, please feel free to check out my other videos on the subject. One last thing. 
I get a lot of questions about how bottom contour relates to where the fish are. The answer is twofold. The first part is the general answer. Many inshore species of fish and bait, particularly those that travel along the surf line, tend to follow bottom contours like highways. Some bottom structures offer advantages to bait species, and some provide feeding opportunities for predator species. Also, many predator species, but not all of them, prefer to have some water over their heads. Conversely, many bait species, but not all of them, like to squeeze into the shallower waters to avoid the larger predators. And most, but not all, of the predator-prey relationship takes place along bottom contours and edges. This is the general rule of thumb. The second part of the answer is that every fish that swims the oceans of the world has its own habits and preferences, and it's up to you to learn what the habits and preferences of your local target species are. My videos can help you with the process of learning what you are looking at when you walk out onto a beach, but only you can learn the habits and preferences of your local bait and predator species. When you put those two pieces of the puzzle together, you will greatly improve your chances for success. That's my view from the beach, so until next time, be well and catch him up.